This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the podcast. This week's guest is Simon Morley, a British artist and art historian. Simon is the author of several books on modern and contemporary art and is a keen rose gardener. Simon's latest book was released a few weeks ago and is called By Any Other Name, A Cultural History of the Rose. During the interview, I asked Simon about the cultural significance of roses throughout history, their symbolism, their origins, and what how we use roses in gardens today says about our society. In the beginning of Simon's book, he writes that the rose is a meme. I began by asking him to explain what he meant by that. Yeah, I mean, the meme is a word that we know from using the internet, don't we? The way images proliferate, travel around. But the word was originally used by the evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins, and he was trying to come up with a way of try- of explaining how cultural uh, norms can continue through time, how they get transferred between people, between whole cultures, whole civilizations, and uh, grow in, in a way a bit like plants or things in nature grow and evolve. So it's a kind of uh, cultural equivalent to the way things evolve in nature. And so my point was simply that if we think about the way the rose has evolved, as a symbol, I mean, through, throughout time, throughout different civilizations, it's taken on the kind of independent force of a meme. So the point about a meme is that it doesn't really depend on individuals or even particular groups of individuals or particular cultures. It just sort of take, keeps on going, developing its own uh, reasons for existing replicating prolifically. And the rose is one of the most extraordinary uh, memes in the sense that it's managed to infiltrate, if you like, so many different parts of human life. That is really interesting because I've just finished a book by Stefano Mancuso about plant intelligence. And in it, he says one of the reasons plants are intelligent is because they quite often use humans to be propagated and therefore to further their genetic material. Um, so that is that is so, they're so intrinsically linked to the human race that it's it's just, you know, it's interesting to think how they've kind of travelled along with us and, and piggybacked on where we've travelled to and, you know, and, and all the rest of it tapped into our consciousness, tapped into our aesthetic appreciation. Um, so why do you think that the rose is, that roses have been so enduringly loved by humans? A uh, very difficult question to answer because, of course, there are so many other lovely flowers around. So why the rose in particular? I suppose one, one thing I should say immediately is that not all human civilizations have loved the rose so ardently or passionately as... Europeans and uh, Middle Eastern people have. Um, for example, in China, although they've got, had lots of roses, species roses there, and they cultivated roses, they didn't love the rose in the same way as the people of the Middle East and the West uh, did. Uh, and that in itself is an interesting cultural question to try to unpick. But I guess. I suppose what it is that's special about the rose, what the rose has that almost no other plant has, no other flower has, is it's um, the combination of its beautiful flower colour and the scent and the prickles, the thorns, this somewhat, we could call it, uncomfortable relationship between something very tender and soft and beautiful Uh, aromatically beautiful, visually beautiful, and something that can actually prick you, cut you, uh, is intended to deter uh, predators, um, is a fascinating uh, combination, don't you think? 
Absolutely. Um, you talked about obviously roses didn't always carry favour uh, with us. And thinking about the Protestant religion and its uh, its rise, why did roses fall out of favour as a symbol of religion around that time? Well, that's mainly part of a bigger a question, which is the, the the question of what is Protestantism. I mean, it's a protest against what the reformers consider to be the the idolatry and the, the sort of uh, implicit paganism of the Roman Catholic Church that had developed a very rich visual symbolism through the use of the saints, images of the saints, martyrs, and particularly the Virgin Mary, with whom the rose is very closely associated. I write quite a lot in the book about the symbolism of the rose in relationship to the Virgin Mary. All that became suspect under Protestantism, which tried to clean out the house, if you like, of Christianity. Uh, It destroyed, literally, uh, the statues and images of of Catholicism went where it could. And as a result of that, uh, particularly the the association of the Rose with the Virgin Mary, whom the Protestants considered was merely the, the mother of Jesus, not um, a divine personage um, made the rose something to be avoided. But even more than that, one could say that the whole idea of beautiful flowers became suspect, particularly amongst the more puritanical Protestants, because the whole point was to avoid indulging the senses. Yeah. Um... It's also interesting, I think, to consider how it kind of links back to paganism. Have I got that right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, why do we give the rose on Valentine's Day? Well, because the rose was very closely connected with the pagan goddess Aphrodite, as the Greeks called her, or Venus for the Romans. It was one of her symbols. There are lots of stories about Aphrodite's um, uh, mythological um, antics, which are connected with the rose. Why the rose became red was because Aphrodite scratched herself on a a thorn of a a white rose bush and turned the white roses to red with, with her blood and so on. Even her birth is associated with roses. So in other words, within Greek or Roman culture, the rose had this very close link with the goddess of love. And because of that, uh, it's trickled down t- to us uh, in relation as a relationship with uh, Valentine's Day, a, a day when we celebrate our loved one. And that's also why, of course, it was, it was a, the rose was difficult to assimilate into Catholicism when the Catholic Church became the Church of Rome, that the Christian Church became the Church of Rome. It had to sort of um, literally de-thorn the rose, the rose's association with this uh, pagan goddess of love, uh, erotic love, not spiritual love. And so the Mary's rose, the rose associated with the Virgin Mary, is always shown without thorns. And there is a thornless rose, isn't there, that you mentioned in the book. Can you tell us what that is? Yeah, there are, there are a few roses that have no or very few thorns. One of my favourites called Zephyrine Drouin. She's a Bourbon rose. In other words, she's a relatively recent um, cultivated rose, not a natural species rose. There are a few. There is a Chinese rose that, that is thornless species rose, but the vast majority of roses have thorns and some have serious uh, thorns. <laughs> I mean, very nasty looking thorns. So a, a rose without thorns, you see, the thorn was symbol of sin in the Catholic church. It became a symbol of sin. It, it was said that in the Garden of Eden, there were roses, but they didn't have thorns and they only grew thorns after Eve introduced evil into the garden. So um, you can see how that rich use of symbolism attaches itself to these two aspects of the rose. One, the beauty 
and scent the flower and the other the, the prickliness of the thorns mm. yeah i i know this is a very broad question um but there are so many um concepts and beliefs that the rose can signify and a lot of them you you really went in depth with and i wondered just reading it because some of them struck a real chord with me, whereas other ones I thought, oh, I, I can see it, but, you know, I don't I don't necessarily kind of get it. I wondered what of those concepts most resonated with you? Yeah, that's a that's that's a good question. And it's one that I suppose I tried to uh, tease out in writing the book, tried to work out what it was about the rose that was so fascinating to me, I mean, on an emotional level, if you like, not on a cultural, historical level. And I think it is this fact that the rose has thorns. The rose is a, a plant that has a flower and a thorn. And that this resonates on a deeply emotional level. Uh, for example, it means that uh, Everything that brings pleasure is likely also to bring a pain. Think of love, for example. That the it's not possible to to completely separate the beautiful from the ugly, or the the peaceful from the violent. That all these kind of uh, ways in which we divide, separate what's called binary thinking, you know, separate into opposites, is a um, is an illusion of our of our mind, and that actually the rose is a way of reminding us that these things are all mixed up together, and in that sense, it's a kind of moral uh, lesson uh, on one level, or even a philosophical lesson about uh, reality. Yeah, it's um, as I say, you really explore so many concepts in the book and they're all you know valid and um and it is really interesting to read it and to and like you say consider your own relationship with the rose um you know i'm sure lots of people love them but haven't really explored why um so it's a real thought provoking book um and i think probably tapping into that because i have like an in english centric view of gardening that's how i come at gardening and horticulture and roses I probably think, you know, a rose is quintessentially English. Um, but it was really interesting what you said about the nations that were important players in the development of the rose varieties that we know today. So can you just, you know, talk a little bit about that? Well, again, that that's uh, it, it's a trick. That's a tricky question, really, because it, in, it depends on two things. One is where you're looking at it, this question from. And, and the other one is what sort of time frame do you want to to look at the question in because it's certainly true that when you talk about the kind of roses that we've got in our gardens the story is uh, almost entirely as a, a, a french and english story that most of the roses the important roses are the result of uh, first of all french uh, breeders in the early 19th century and then English, mostly English breeders in the second half of the 19th century. And by that, I mean, this is the period when the two key stalwarts of modern rose gardening, the hybrid tea rose and the floribunda rose were developed. And then more recently, another Englishman, David Austin, uh, 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 has developed what he calls his English roses, which are supposed to be and really do often look like the best of the old kind of roses. I mean, by old, I'm talking, aren't I, about roses before the, the mid-1860s, uh, when the first, what we now call hybrid tea rose, was uh, marketed, a rose called La France, which <laughs> tells you where it came from. Yeah, the Brits, the English, we think the rose is English, but, you know, if you ask an Iranian, where they think roses uh, come from, they'll say it's it's from where they're, they're from. And in a sense, historically, they're more right because most of the roses originally came from the Middle East and growing roses, cultivating roses as a cash crop is an ancient 
business in the Middle East, still going on in Iran, Syria, other countries uh, in that area. And um, so, and then of course, there's China to think about. You asked the Chinese about roses, they'd also remind you that there are more species of roses in China than anywhere else, that they've been cultivating and breeding roses for longer than anybody else. However, as I mentioned earlier, they didn't imbue it with the same rich symbolism as we have in the West. So to answer your question short form, yeah, I suppose the rose is especially associated with English, Englishness, particularly because it's the national ro ro rose, the Tudor rose. We have the Tudor rose, don't we? We have our war of the roses historically. Uh, it's our national flower, but it's also, by the way, the national flower of Iran and of the United States. Um, so why don't we just say that wherever you're from, you can say it the rose belongs to you. <laughs> yeah, I like that. That's great. When you started writing the book, did you ever think, have a moment where you went, I don't know how I'm going to pull all these threads together? <laughs> uh, more than one moment like <laughs> that. But I have to say, I had, you know, there are there's tons of other books on roses. I mean, too many for, to, for anybody to read them all. Uh, but they did help me uh, cut through the, the thicket of Rose, the Rose story in a sense, because I could draw on them to some extent, uh, but also see where they seem to be missing something and where I could add something. So as I say in, in my acknowledgements, you know, my book sort of stands on the, on the shoulders of all these other books on about roses. Uh, particularly, I mean, my book, my book is not a picture book. Most roses nowadays are picture books, really aren't they? They're, they have text, of course, but they're, they're very much lots of nice pictures of roses. But we made the decision early on that this was going to be a, a, a text-led book, a book that's mostly words with a few nice pictures in, a, you know, kind of, uh, there's a section of pictures, but essentially it's to be read. Uh, so, yes, it was a very, very uh, difficult subject to try to Keep a keep hold of to make sense of, but I think I done 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 a fairly good job of it. I think you did a very good job. Um, so thinking about what you wrote, um, there's a sentence in it that really struck me, and it and it is that you say aesthetic horticultural considerations were often coupled with a theoretical component, and the selection and arrangement of plants were determined by the botanical theory of the period which in its turn reflected the way the world was perceived to be ordered. And so I thought it would be a really good question to ask you, what does the way we use roses today tell us about how we perceive the world to be ordered? Yeah, it is a good question. And again, I could <laughs> go on quite a long time trying to answer it and we talk, we could discuss it. But I suppose, okay, let me put it this way. I grew up in, a, in Eastbourne, south coast of England. My parents had a nice sort of a detached house in a sort of suburb of Eastbourne. And guess what? We had lots of what I now know uh, are hybrid tea rose bushes in our, in our front garden. And they were pruned religiously, kept well under control, neat and tidy. And now I could say that, well, what does that tell us about the culture that I grew up in. Why do we treat our roses like that? Why do we want our roses to be like that? Whereas in the past, roses were grown in very different ways and in other parts of the world were grown in very different ways. And now in our gardens are often grown in, in different ways to that. And it seems to me that you could argue that that kind of vigorous disciplining of the roses, if you like, was a reflection of the way in which we thought we should behave as people in society, uh, obeying the rules, staying in place, dressing tidily, doing our work, uh, a kind of sense of uh, self-discipline that we imposed, <laughs> imposed on the roses. 
Now, of course, I could go too far about that kind of making those kinds of analogies. Um, but I think if you compare the way other cultures have cultivated roses, for example, uh, Persian culture, Iranian culture, Middle Eastern culture, they have a very different way of treating roses or even imagining what a rose should be. I don't think actually it is taking it too far to think about um, how our gardens as expressions of, you know, our, our kind of psyche, really. I did interview uh, Professor Harriet Gross and she wrote a book called The Psychology of Gardening. And she said, you know, that that ordered sense that, you know, that, that control that we're trying to impose on our gardens very much taps into where we are, you know, mentally. Um, but also there is a bit at the end of your book, which for for gardeners like probably like myself and and possibly many of the people who are listening to the podcast um i found it quite funny uh i there, there's a bit where you talk about rewilding and the new perennial movement in gardens and the fact that those kind of gardening movements may by definition exclude roses um and and you talk about what those movements are trying to achieve um and i just wondered if you could you know talk about that because it's really interesting to get your perspective on it it's interesting isn't it the way fashions in gardening uh change and yeah they they must be the result of deeper cultural forces they don't just happen in isolation do they but well, let, let me tell you a little story. I start my book with the story of the English poet Rupert Brooke sitting in a cafe in Berlin writing a poem which became known as the Old Vicarage Grandchester in which he remembered England. And in that poem, he compares roses to tulips. And he says the tulips uh, are, sim are symbolic of like the English, the German character, the conformist Germans, tulips bloom as they are told, he writes, whereas in his homeland, England, he celebrates the unkept about those hedges blow, an English unofficial rose. In other words, he's celebrating the fact that the English are more uh, freedom-loving, uh, eccentric, they don't conform. Well, I think it's quite possible that since Rupert Brooke wrote that poem, roses have turned into tulips often. You know, they bloom, as they are told, in our suburban gardens, don't they? And this might be one of the reasons, more generally, why there's been a rebellion against or reaction against that kind of gardening. It's a sort of reflection of a desire to break away from conformity to the rules and regulations, bourgeois, middle class, whatever you want to call them, uh, conventions, which the garden seems to epitomize, or a certain kind of garden sort of epitomizes with the, the neatly tended flower beds, the well-cut grass lawns, and so on. And yeah, the, the new perennial movement seems to be trying to let its hair down literally it seems a little bit like a, a late flowering of a kind of hippie uh, mentality and in that sense it's great because it means it's all about expressing a more free relationship to the world one that lets things be rather than tries to control them although of course you know it, it's all a bit of an illusion because obviously they're still gardening, aren't they? In other words, they're still dominating and controlling nature. It might look wild, but it isn't wild because it's been planted. It's been arranged to look wild. So it's a sort of effect of wildness. Yeah, um, very valid point. It is just another form of gardening. Um, so... I, I can't really let you go without asking you a question that you, you may well dread and you may well have been asked before and will be again. What is your favourite rose? <laughs> yeah, I have been asked that before. Well, you know what? I think it's the it's a species rose, Rosa rugosa, which is a lovely sort of cerise pink 
color and it's unbelievably prickly, thorny, and it has a beautiful uh, scent and it's jolly easy <laughs> to grow, which helps. In fact, too easy because it just spreads. It's, it grows by su suckering roots and just spreads everywhere. But I think all in all, I like that rose best. I mean, it's got beautiful uh, single uh, uh, blossom flowers, open cup with lovely orange sepals in the, in the center. So it's a real, it's a simple rose, but it's a sort of 100% rose, if you like. Oh, and also I should add that it's a native of these parts where I live. I'm, I'm talking to you from Korea, not Europe. And it's a native of Korea, Japan, and China. And at a certain point was transplanted to Europe. So I guess quite a lot of our listeners have got Rosa Rugosas, one kind or another, either the species or, or um, hybrids of Rugosas growing in their gardens. To find out more about roses and to share your favourites, you can follow Simon on Instagram where he's Morley P. Simon. And also check out his blog where he's frequently posting articles. The link to the blog is in the show notes. Thank you to Simon for speaking to me over Zoom from South Korea and sharing his wealth of knowledge and research. Thanks to you for listening and to those of you who've recently rated and reviewed the podcast, it is much appreciated. So this week's bug of the week may very well be familiar to anyone who's lived or worked in a wooden clad building and seen these bugs congregating in biblical numbers. As we head on towards winter, the shorter days and falling temperatures will have brought most of our resident insect species to the dormant stage of their lives, where they'll be hidden away within their habitats as eggs, larvae, pupae or adults, hoping to escape the potentially lethal weather that the winter months could bring. And some of these insects will have found the ideal hideaway in our homes, particularly within the areas where it's dry, cool and frost-free, and where they can hopefully remain undisturbed until the spring. So it's not too surprising, when up in the loft to perhaps grab the Christmas decoration box, that we might spot a group of ladybirds, a lacewing, or even a dormant queen wasp up amongst the rafters. However, there's one overwintering bug that if it's there will likely be a lot more obvious to see and could well be assumed as an infestation. And that's the cluster fly. Cluster flies are particularly common in and around grassland areas where they develop from underground larvae that predate on earthworms. They usually have two or three generations a year with the final adults emerging from the ground at the end of summer to find and feed on late season nectar. Then throughout autumn days, as their name suggests, they'll gather in groups, often on the south facing walls of the houses that they've chosen for their winter refuge. And as the sun sets, the groups crawl up the wall, into crevices, under the eaves, and into the lofts, where they'll cluster together, sometimes in their thousands, to remain dormant throughout the winter months. Although cluster flies look similar to house flies, they're larger, but pose no health risk to us. However, they could become a nuisance in homes that remain warm throughout the winter, since some flies may become active too early and begin buzzing around the rooms. But eradicating cluster flies from a home during winter is not usually necessary, since they won't damage the house and should all disperse on their own during spring, or otherwise they'll die. However, if needs be, an industrial vacuum cleaner could be used to collect the dormant flies, or as a last resort, a professional pest controller could fumigate them, so long as there's adequate ventilation and no bats in the loft. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast. 